Hi there, I'm Christian and you're watching A Dev Story. Today I'm starting a new series of videos where I will be talking about event-driven architecture. You may see this one as the fourth videos in the series of the software architecture introduction. And actually I will be building up on the example from there. But actually you can start directly from here. So with that additional introduction, let's start. First, let's get into the concepts. On one hand, we have an event. An event is basically something that happens. On the other hand, we have a command. A command is an order, a request that you have to another party to give you a response. An event can be communicated in the form of an event notification. And a command can be communicated also in the form of a message. These two things are very similar in terms of the information that they contain. And you can see that an event notification will also be referred sometimes as a message. In practice, you will see many people referring to both of these things as events. And if you are a purist, you might disagree with this and you might be right because an event, as we mentioned, is something that happens. It's not a notification or the message associated with events. And it's also very different from the intention of the command. And we will see that intention is very, very important later. But since in this channel we try to focus more on the practical side, we will call this an event for the rest of the series. So this event or message have different characteristics, as we mentioned before. It could contain data associated with the event or the command, or it could just be a notification that something happened. Additionally, something that is very important is that it is immutable. This event is the base of what is called event-driven architecture. There are many definitions of what event-driven is, if it should be only event-based, or it could also include other types of messages. So sometimes you might see also event-driven architecture mentioned as message-driven architecture or message-driven architecture being a generalization of the event-driven architecture. If you want to get more in-depth into this topic, I recommend you to watch Martin Fowler's presentation, The Many Meanings of Event-Driven Architecture. But this is what I mean with event-driven architecture throughout the series. So bear with me and let's talk a little bit more about the details of it. Event-driven architectures usually have at least three components. One is the producer, another one is the broker, and the last one is consumer. Basically, a producer creates the events that are going to be redirected by the broker into the right consumers. The consumers will react to this event and execute the things that they need to execute. These components go by different names. An event-driven architecture or message-driven architecture are usually referred to as published subscribe model too. So why we will use event-driven architecture? So one of the benefits that it provides is that it allows you to decouple different components. It also allows you to invert dependencies. And finally, it also allows you to scale better. And I will show you that right now in an example. So usually you will have one service that wants to communicate to another service, for example, service one to get service two. When you do this, there is a coupling between the service one and service two, like service one needs to know about the existence of service two in order to call it and this creates a dependency. In an event-driven architecture fashion, we will still have the service one and service two, and, but instead of communicating directly from service one, what we would do is to send an event. Now service two needs to know about this event and process it. So in this way, we have inverted dependencies. We have also decoupled them because service one doesn't need to know that there's a service two, neither does service two need to know about service one. They just need to know about an event of producing and consuming this event. Additionally, as we mentioned before, events are immutable. And by being immutable, it means that they can be processed in parallel with other systems too. So this event can be consumed from additional services if we want to, to execute additional things. Also, when you have communication using events, events can be persisted. And this way, the information can be retrieved even at later stages and not only during the call, like it happens when you just make a direct call between one service and the next. There is also no single point of failure, so the system is more robust. Basically, when you're communicating from service one to service two in the regular request response approach, you need both services to be online and active to receive the request. But in the event-driven system, one of the two systems can be down after you have sent the event the event will be, be persisted in the broker until a consumer reads it. This allows you to have more flexibility or more robustness, let's say, in the case of failures. 
Some cons that the event-driven architecture have are, for example, performance. Before, you just call from service one to service two directly. Now you have an intermediary that will be redirecting the messages to the right services. So this adds some performance hit to the architecture in, in pro of a scalability, as we mentioned before. Th there is also consistency. When you are calling directly from one service to another one, everything is happening kind of at the same time. But when you have an event, there's always a delay between you send it and another one's reset. And if you have multiple services reading from the same event, each of them can read at different times and they can be out of sync. There can also be more complexity when you're building event-driven architectures because it's harder to track what happens and when it happens and how the communication lines are happening throughout the system. When you have direct dependencies, you know exactly who you're calling and when you're calling them. So the important thing is, when then should you use an event-driven architecture for your solution? And there are different cases. The main one is when scalability is more important than performance. That's also when you want to have that data replication. So when you have data replication, it's basically you need the same information in multiple systems. So instead of calling different systems to pass that information or have all the services calling the same database, you can use events so these systems copy the same information from the same source. Also, when you want to have parallel processing, if you have multiple services that you need to execute at the same time, event-driven architecture works really well with this. When decoupling is very important and you have maybe different heterogeneous systems and you want to have all of them really decoupled, then event-driven architecture is really good for that because as I mentioned before, the contract becomes the event. And as long as you respect the event, then all the system will work. Now let's see this with an example. Let's go back to our e-commerce side system that we worked with in the software architecture introduction series. Let's say our user has gone through the website, browsed some products, added to cart, and now is ready to buy. After the user clicks on the buy button, maybe our system can trigger an event called product purchased. And this product purchased event can have some data. And this product purchased event can be processed by different systems. For example, it can be processed by the inventory system where it will decrease the inventory for that product. And it can also be consumed by another service, for example, the recommendation service that will be processing this for future recommendations for our user. And this is where we are going to get into the beginning of the video. Because in this case, you can see that intention matters. In this case, we just sent an event and different systems can consume it. And we are not expecting from the store or from the UI, expecting a response from the services. We are just sending the event and any system interested in this event can subscribe to it and execute the task that they need. But on the other hand, let's see another example where this is not the case and we are actually expecting a response. In this case, the user clicks the buy button and we want to confirm the payment before we ship the products. So we can still do it in an event-driven system. We can send an event, for example, called confirm payment with additional data. Then the payment service will read this event and process it and see if it's successful or not and send a response. As you can see in this case, it's very different from the first one, right? Because in the first example, we didn't expect a response. In this case, we're expecting it before we do other things. There's also some minor differences that notice the intention of the event. In the first one, we just said something that happened. We said product purchased. In this case, we're saying confirm payment, right? The verb has some intention about what we want to do. And even though it's decoupled, like uh, the UI service or the store service doesn't need to know about the payment service, it is expecting that another service will do something and send me an event back. So it is, in that case, it's decoupled, but the response is still required. And we will see why this is important in the next video in the series. And that's the end of this video. If there is something that wasn't clear, just ping me in the comment section below and I will try to reply to them. Also, don't miss the links that I put in the description where I point to the presentations, like I mentioned before, the Martin Fowler's presentation, but also additional books, both free and paid, that are really good that cover event-driven architecture. And of course, if you want to keep watching the series, don't miss the subscribe button. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time.